Hello, Tyler here, and today I'll be talking about the cholinergic basal forebrain and its relationship to Alzheimer's disease. I will cover the general structure and function of the basal forebrain, its cholinergic projections into other parts of the brain, answer the question of how scientists have come to the conclusion that the cholinergic basal forebrain is heavily involved in the pathology and progression of Alzheimer's disease using some of the popular neuroscience techniques, such as brain imaging, lesions, and pharmacological treatment. How that led to the development and implementation of the most common class of anti-dementia drugs, and finally, the mechanism of action of these drugs. Let's start with what is the cholinergic basal forebrain? Here we have a slice of the forebrain, and if you look at, at the cross section, you can see that the basal forebrain is located in the frontal lobe, below the cortex, and above the temporal lobe. One of the main functions of the basal forebrain nuclei is regulation of body temperature after receiving thermosensing information from the hypothalamus nearby. It is also involved in the onset and maintenance of sleep. Its projections to the hippocampus suggest that it also plays a special role in learning and memory formation. So let's talk about the acetylcholine system real quick. Here we have another slice of the forebrain. The basal forebrain is part of the major diffuse modulatory cholinergic system, which arises from the basal forebrain and the brainstem. The cholinergic neurons lie scattered among several nuclei at the core of the telencephalon, as well as medial and ventral to the basal ganglia. The best known nuclei are the medial septal nuclei and the basal nucleus of Maynard, which provide innervation of the hippocampus and most of the cholinergic innervation of the neocortex. Similar to the noradrenergic and serotonergic systems, the cholinergic system has been implicated in regulating the brain's excitability during arousal and sleep-wake cycles. The medial septal nuclei and basal nucleus of Maynard project widely upon the cerebral cortex, including the hippocampus. The pontomesencephalotegmental complex projects to the thalamus and parts of the forebrain. Next up, how can we investigate the role of the basal forebrain and what's its relationship to Alzheimer's disease? We can do this by using some of the widely available neuroscience techniques, such as immunotoxic lesions, pharmacological agents, brain imaging, such as MRI, and genetics. So let's just talk about Alzheimer's disease for a minute. Here we have a healthy brain alongside the brain of a patient with severe Alzheimer's disease. As you can see, in severe Alzheimer's disease, there's extreme degeneration of brain matter. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, a category of brain disorders where the main symptoms are memory loss, cognitive impairment, and degeneration of brain matter. It most commonly affects adults over the age of 65. The causes of Alzheimer's disease are not completely understood, but it appears to be a combination of genetic predisposition and environmental factors. Now let's take a little closer look and look at the molecular characteristics of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by the formation of misfolded amyloid beta plaques in the intracellular space and misfolded tau proteins that form neurofibrillary tangles in the cell body of neurons. Tau is a microtubule associated protein found in neuronal axons in the brain. Its physiological function is to maintain microtubule structure and function Tau is normally not highly phosphorylated, but under pathological conditions, it becomes hyperphosphorylated. This hyperphosphorylation causes uh, uh, configuration changes that result in defective microtubules and elevated cytosolic tau, which leads to the formation of neurofibrillary tangles. As these neurofibrillary tangles get deposited around neurons, they reduce the number of synapses, cause neurotoxicity, and result in cellular dysfunction. On the other side here, we have amyloid plaques. Now let's talk about the amyloid pathways real quick. Here is a, just a general uh, amyloid pathway for, uh, for you guys to browse. Under non-pathological conditions, amyloid precursor protein is cleaved by alpha secretase or gamma secretase uh, shown on the left and right here, which has downstream effects through the ACID signaling which is involved in the transcriptional regulation of neuroprotective pathways, such as normal synaptic signaling, synaptic plasticity, learning and memory, neuronal survival, and emotional behaviors. In the middle, you'll see under pathological conditions like Alzheimer's disease, amyloid precursor protein, APP, is cleaved by beta secretase, base, 
which uh, still releases the transcription factor ACID, but forms insoluble amyloid beta plaque. These plaques aggregate in the intracellular space between neurons. These plaques directly interact with MDMA and glutamate receptors involved in memory. They can form reactive oxygen species leading to oxidative damage and also interact with acetylcholine receptors. Now, how does this involve the cholinergic basal forebrain? Aside from what I just mentioned about amyloid beta plaques actions at the acetylcholine receptor in neurons, interestingly, the basal forebrain cholinergic nuclei are the most susceptible to formation of amyloid beta plaques in neurofibrillary tangles. In Alzheimer's disease, they are typically the first neurons to show signs of degeneration. In addition, there's plenty of evidence that shows a decrease in cholinergic signaling results in an increase in amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Alzheimer's disease is one of the most heavily funded research topics by the National Institute of Health, but disease progression is still poorly understood. There are still a lot of questions surrounding the interaction between these various elements of the disease that we just covered. The question now becomes, what hypothesis can we form on the initiation of Alzheimer's disease and what can we do to treat that? There are several hypotheses on how Alzheimer's disease initiates and progresses, the most popular and well-studied of which are the amyloid cascade hypothesis that we kind of just covered, where the amyloid plaques accumulate, uh, leading to Alzheimer's pathology. Second is the tau hypothesis, also just covered. But the other one is the cholinergic hypothesis, the first two have been heavily studied and pharmacological interventions have been devised to target both amyloid and tau. Both targets have had drugs go through clinical trials, but no drug that targets these two aspects of the disease have been successful as of yet. The cholinergic hypothesis, while not accounting for the entirety of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease, has drugs that address this aspect of the disease. Addressing the cholinergic deficits has shown quite a bit of promise in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and remains to be one of the most effective treatments today. Scientists came to this conclusion by asking several questions. One, is there a neurotransmitter whose actions critically support memory? Two, if there are changes in that neurotransmitter and disorders of age-related memory loss, most importantly, Alzheimer's disease? And if that's true, what neurons are responsible for producing that neurotransmitter? Do these neurons undergo degeneration in Alzheimer's disease? And will replacing the neurotransmitter confer symptomatic improvement? Let's try to address some of these questions. The first being, what neurotransmitters are involved? In the 1970s, it was discovered by using pharmaceutical and lesion studies that acetylcholine played a key role in memory during rodent studies. This was later confirmed in humans by Druckmann and Levitt using cholinergic and antagonists and agonists. To answer questions two and three, are there changes in acetylcholine neurotransmitters in Alzheimer's disease, and what neurons produce these neurotransmitters, uh, we can take a look at, the, at what we have here. We have a normal control subject uh, and then a patient with mild Alzheimer's disease. Looking at the MRI here, you can see reduced neocortical and, uh, and amygdaloid acetylcholine activity. In mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease, there's a reduction of this acetylcholine esterase activity in areas of the brain but not areas of the basal forebrain, such as the nucleus basalis of Minert. This suggests a dying back of cholinergic neurons rather than cell bodies. Let's go on to the fourth question. Do these undergo degeneration in Alzheimer's disease? Here we see a gray matter atrophy associated with the progression of Alzheimer's disease using MRI and voxel-based morphometry. This analysis showed significant atrophy initially in the medial temporal structures in the basal forebrain during the early stages of mild cognitive impairment. As you can see, when the disease progresses, these areas atrophy even more, and atrophy extends into the lateral temporal cortex, parietal cortex, and other areas of the brain as the disease progresses. Let's take another look at another MRI study. Here we have the association of thal phases in the basal forebrain region. Thal phases are based on the detection of immunopositive amyloids, the amyloid plaques that are the hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. The numbers you see at the top here indicate the Y-coordinate of the MRI. 
This voxel-wise comparison of multiple brain images accounts for the differences between various MRIs controlling for age, sex, total intracranial volume, and the temporal interval between the MRI scan and death. As you can see, there's a significant association of thal phases within the basal forebrain region across all people. Fifth question, will replacing the neurotransmitter lead to symptomatic improvement? The overarching conclusion is yes, but we cannot simply replace the neurotransmitter here. Instead, we focus on better management of the neurotransmitters that we do have, which leads us to one of the most popular uh, pharmacological interventions developed to help treat Alzheimer's disease. As I get into that, let's quickly review acetylcholine signaling. Acetyl-CoA and choline in the presynaptic nerve terminal come together via choline acetyltransferase to form acetylcholine, also known as ACH. ACH is released by the presynaptic terminal and it interacts, interacts with receptors on the postsynaptic terminal, such as the ionotropic nicotinic acetylcholine receptors shown here in gray. Ionotropic means it affects ion channels, which generally result in excitation of the neuron, giving you a very instant effect. The other is uh, metabotropic muscarinic G protein coupled receptors. Metabotropic meaning that it initiates metabolic steps to modulate cell activity, which can have an array of effects depending on the subtype of the receptor, but are generally slower than ionotropic responses. The remaining acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft is broken down by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to form choline and acetate subunits, which are then recycled by the presynaptic nerve terminal to be used in this process all over again. In general, this acetylcholine signaling that we're seeing here happens at the neuromuscular junction to cause muscle contractions, but it's also very widely used in the autonomic nervous system. All preganglionic neurons and postganglionic parasympathetic neurons utilize acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. A drop in acetylcholine release also affects memory as its release in the hippocampus is heavily involved in cognition as well as formation of declarative and episodic memories through the consolidation of short-term memory to long-term memory. We know from previous research that there is impaired synthesis and secretion of acetylcholine in cholinergic neurons in the cerebral cortex and basal forebrain in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease has a decrease in cholinergic activity that results in an increase in the formation of amyloid beta and neurofibrillary tangles. In order to help alleviate some of this, drugs were developed to interact with acetylcholine sig signaling pathways. So far, pharmacological treatment has shown to improve symptoms, but does little for overall disease control. Let's take another look at this pathway with our drug in involved now. And we'll also talk about the mechanism of action for this drug. The most common drug class used to treat dementia is acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Acetylcholinesterase inhibitors such as denepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine are used in an attempt to increase cholinergic activity by reversibly binding to acetylcholinesterase. This binding of the drug causes a change in conformation, which therefore causes a change in shape. It is temporarily unable to bind acetylcholine and break it down. Like I said, this is a reversible interaction, so eventually the drug will unbind, acetylcholinesterase will return to its original conformation, and will be able to carry out its normal function of breaking down acetylcholine. By inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, we can boost the amount of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft at the remaining synapse, synapses that have not degenerated. This leads to improvement of some of the cognitive and memory deficits with Alzheimer's patients. Although there is little evidence that this drug halts the progression of Alzheimer's disease, there is some evidence that acetylcholinesterase inhibitors use early in Alzheimer's disease reduces gray matter and basal forebrain atrophy as shown here. So in conclusion, the cholinergic basal forebrain is the center of cholinergic signaling in the brain. It has homeostatic functions in alertness, thermoregulation, and is involved in the formation of new memories by an innervation in the hippocampus. The basal forebrain is one of the first areas of the brain to show pathological signs of Alzheimer's disease, such as amyloid beta plaques or tile neurofibrillary tangles. Brain imaging, lesion studies, genetic analysis, and pharmacological intervention 
have made it possible to study this relationship between the basal forebrain cholinergic signaling and Alzheimer's disease, which ultimately led to the formation of the most common dementia drug, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, which have been shown to help with memory and cognition, and some think that it may slow down, but not entirely halt, the formation of amyloid beta plaques and neurofibrillary tangles.